1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 20. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers. I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you, are, when you were pagans, somehow or, or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to teach, uh, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the works of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one, just as He determines. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jew or Jews or Greek, slaves or free, and and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were in ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Uh, Jesus was a great storyteller. Jesus told wonderful stories that we should take notice of and we should take care to listen to. One of those stories was about one sheep. In fact, it was about more than one sheep, but it focused primarily on one sheep. One sheep who was lost and Jesus determined to find that one sheep. And when he found that one sheep, he brought that sheep back into the entire flock. And so that sheep was no longer alone, but was in a larger group of people. In my mind, that's kind of an image of the church. Jesus finding the individual and bringing them back into the flock where they belong, where they are safe, and where they are with their own kind. And so it should disturb us to know that there are people, many people, who are choosing and determining to walk away from that flock, to choose not to be a part of the safety of that flock, the safety of that pasture, and to abandon it. Yesterday I received a promotional email about a new book coming out um, by two pastors in, in Florida, America, who recognised that people were leaving church. They got some funding to do some proper research to confirm this was their hypothesis. We're currently in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of the United States. And their study confirmed the hypothesis that roughly 40 million adult Americans who used to go to worship monthly now no longer go at all. 40 million used to go to church once a month but now no longer go at all and most of that shift has happened in the last 
30 years. I've also recently read a book called Unmissable Church. And that picture is apparently not coming up. Hang on. Hold on, step back. Uh, anyway, this book, Unmissable Church, which is based on research in Australia, and it's showing that too many Christian people don't come to church consistently. You see, there was a time when regular church attendance, and some of you will know this, that regular church attendance meant going to church how often? Twice. Twice on a Sunday was regular church attendance. Now, regular church attendance is considered to be, well, twice a month, and you're a regular church attender. I want, to, I want to help us understand just something of what the Bible has to say about being involved in a church and about the value of being consistent in your attendance at church. But I do need to preface it and go back to that sheep story because the goal isn't to build the church. The goal isn't to have a big church. If that happens, praise God. But the goal is to find those lost sheep and to bring them in and keep them safe within the flock. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons people leave churches and I'm happy to have those discussions later on, but let's start with reasons why the church matters. My first point is that the church is a body and it's a body which is a part of the church, it's a body which you belong to. It's different to other organisations that you might belong to. It's much more than just a club. Some of you belong to car clubs. Uh, some of you might belong to professional uh, organisations. Well, church, there are some similarities to that, but church is different. But some of the similarities, there's a purpose to what we're about. In a club, there are responsibilities. The members meet together. The members pay their fees. There's an expectation that these things will happen. There are benefits too to being a member of that club. Some of you are members of Costco, which I don't fully grasp the value of paying a membership to go shopping when you can go shopping somewhere else. But we have that discussion at home sometimes. There are benefits. You get discounts on certain things when you're a member. You might get special seats at events when you're a part of that organisation. On Thursday night, uh, St Andrew's Christian College celebrated 40 years of existence. It was wonderful. Lauren was on stage, she was involved, she was having fun, it was a great crowd of people, a large gathering, it was wonderful. Because I'm a board member, I got a special seat. I was able to just wander down to the front and sit in one of the best seats in the place. When you're a part of a club, there are, spe- there are benefits that come to it. But church is more than just a club. And church is more than a team. There's something like that, building a team and, and bringing a church together helps to do that. And Lily mentioned some of that in her children's talk, that we're bringing p- different people together, different skills, different abilities They're working together to achieve something. If you're like me and you enjoyed The Lord of the Rings, both the book and the film, you'll see this fairly ragtag group of people joining together to form a fellowship with a common purpose, working together. In a team, the older members help the junior members. That's how it should happen anyway. There's a lot that happens in clubs that will happen in churches but there is a fundamental difference. The history of an organisation will show you who created it, who was there and what its purpose, well, what its purpose was supposed to be when it began. Things drift and often organisations end up being completely not what they were intended to be. The church was created by Jesus and was and is empowered by the Spirit of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, as he's talking to his disciples, and Peter says to him, you are the Christ, 
Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Five great words to have in your mind from Jesus. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church was built, was established by Jesus. Importantly, the church continues to be built by Jesus. I read church growth books. I read the strategies of how, what you can do to help people come to church. And honestly, I want to take on some of those things. I don't want to do things that gets in the way of people coming to church. Why do we meet at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning? Because it's a sensible time to meet. There's nothing holy about 10 o'clock, but if I said that we were going to meet at 5 o'clock on a Sunday morning, would anyone else be excited by that? I'm not sure that I would be excited by that either. There are things that we do to help get together. But it is Jesus who will build his church. And many of you know this because it's your experience. You, had, you would have no interest in a church if it wasn't for something that Jesus did in your heart and soul. The church continues to be built by Jesus. The church is empowered by the Spirit of God. At the very beginning of the church, well, when did the church begin? We could argue about that. But at the very beginning of the Christian church, after Jesus had said to his disciples, wait, you wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And then the Spirit arrived. And there was a dramatic change. The hidden disciples of Jesus became visible witnesses. Those who were trying to be the candle uh, under a bowl became the city on a hill. The hidden disciples became witnesses. The church is the body of Christ and the body works best when all parts are working together. The church is a body and the body is many parts. Can someone turn off this heater, please? I'm uh, expiring up here. Thank you. The body is many parts and you are one of them. Do you believe that? The, the body is many parts and you are one of them. Each part is performing its task. And so Paul, who wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, takes up the image of the human body. It, he uses the image beautifully in chapter 12 from verses 12 to 26, and we didn't read all of them this morning. Let me encourage you this afternoon to sit down with chapter 12 and read it carefully and see what Paul has to say about the human body and how that applies to the churches. What do we learn about the human body? Well, I think the human body is one of the most amazing and remarkable things on planet Earth. It is so complicated. It is so beautiful and it is just so disgusting at the same time. Over recent months, I've had to go and see a podiatrist. I've got sore feet. And uh, I sit in the chair, I take off my shoes, I take off my socks and this young lady massages my feet. And all I can think is, this is the most disgusting thing on earth. How do you do this? And then I remembered, you know, there are doctors who do colonoscopies and things. Aren't there? How do people take on these tasks? But I'm glad she's there and I'm glad she's looking after my feet. So my feet can do what feet are supposed to do. I want my eyes to do what my eyes are supposed to do. I want my ears to do what ears are supposed to do, and, and so on. Now, I'm amazed when I see people using their feet to do what I would use my hands to do. 
People who have no hands, who can paint beautifully, who can put on makeup. Someone, we even saw a video of someone playing a cello with their feet. I can't get my head around how that can happen. It's amazing because they have been able to learn to make their feet do something if their feet weren't designed to do. It's brilliant. But imagine if someone had two perfectly workable arms and decided they would rather learn to use their feet to play the cello. Well, I'd be impressed, but I wouldn't celebrate it. I'd I'd be wondering, why would you make it so much harder on yourself to learn the cello than it needed to be? And why does the Bible talk about the church like a human body? Because the church is a body. And in the church, feet should do what feet should do. Some of you are the feet of the church. And if you think I'm now saying that feet are disgusting, um, the Bible has something to say about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Ears should do what ears do. And some of you are excellent listeners because you're doing what you should do. Mouths should do what mouths do. I've used this illustration. I was talking about this passage once before in a church in Tasmania. And I said, Ruth, you are the mouth of this church. And she just looked at me like I'd said the most deeply offensive thing I could have said to her. I wasn't intending to make her sound like a gossip at all. What I meant was, Ruth was someone who could sit at a bus stop and just begin a conversation with people. She was a mouth of the church. She would just talk with people about her faith. She would just talk with people naturally, people that she's never met before. There are many things that can cripple a church. There are many things that can cripple a church. But here's an important one to consider. People who are equipped to be the feet are also trying to be the arm of the church. Sometimes people do that because they would prefer to be the arms and want to take on that role. But often it's because those who are equipped to be the arms just aren't there or aren't consistent or aren't interested. And so someone else needs to step up and take on that role. Is someone else here taking on too much because you are sitting back? The question was asked to the children. What could you do at church? Well, it's a good question for adults as well. Now remember these words in 1 Corinthians were written to a church. It wasn't a healthy church, which is why these words are so important for all churches to listen to. Here's an opportunity for us now to learn from someone else's mistakes and not make them ourselves. So what do we learn here? We learn that each Christian is gifted by the Spirit. Verse 7, that memory verse, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To each one. Now different people have different gifts. Uh, So, imagine we were all the same. I've often thought the world would be a much easier place if everyone was like me. Apparently not. And if the church was all looking like me, not that would be weird because I have a beard and anyway, but if we all look the same, that's not a church, that's a cult. And we don't want that. The Bible tells us each one has a gift. And this is more than a natural ability. So it may build on a natural ability. You might have an ability for uh, organising stuff. And God, in his grace, gives you that spirit of administration and you're able to do that to a whole other level, to a level which just boggles my mind. It's not something for your own benefit, the gift that God gives to you. You might benefit from it. And you often will, as you put your gift into action, 
you will often hear encouragement from people and thanks for what you are doing. Thankfulness for the way that you are putting your gift into action and for the impact that that makes. So I'm tremendously thankful for those people who look after our, our live streaming and our technical stuff. I'm extremely grateful for people who use their gifts of, of hospitality to, to provide morning tea on a Sunday morning. I'm really thankful for those people who want to use their gift, even if they're not sure they have them, to use their gift to connect with people outside our community and make those connections through mainly music. Using your gift might benefit you, but I tell you this, it might also humble you to realise that God is using someone like you, someone like me, can be daunting. Different people have different gifts and it doesn't mean that one gift is more important than the other. You matter. The gift that God has given to you matters. It might not be up front and that's okay. That's okay. Different people have different gifts and different people have different experiences. And as you put your gift into practice, you'll experience something that others do. There's the joy of serving God with what he's given. There's the comfort of helping others in their faith journey. But you'll also experience something that others don't. And this isn't because you're more special. It isn't because God loves you more. It's just that you have a different gift. And when you put your gift into action, you'll experience different things to other people. Look at verses 8 to 11 of chapter 12. Remember the big numbers of the chapters? The small numbers of the verses? To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same Spirit, to another gift of healing, by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. And so the experience of the one who has a message of wisdom will be different to the one who has the gift of healing, which will be different to the one who has the gift of prophecy, which will again be different to the one who has the gift of interpretation of tongues. So what does that mean? Simply this. Don't be jealous. Don't be jealous of the experiences of others as they use their gifts. I know what it's like to feel gifted for something and then to see a younger person come up and recognise they are way more gifted than I am. And to have to deal with the jealousy and the, that's not fair, feelings of that. And then to grow up and in fact celebrate that God has gifted this person in this way and that person is using that gift for God's glory, why would I want to be jealous of that? I want to be on their team. I want them on my team. I want us to work together. The church is the body of Christ and the body works best when all parts are working together. The church is a body and the body is made up of many parts, which means the parts make the body, which means... You matter. And some of you right now, I expect, are saying, no, I don't. I don't matter. If I wasn't here, no one would know. If I wasn't here, no one would care. I've got nothing to offer. I used to be able to do all these great things, but now I can't do the things I used to do and I'm feeling downcast about that. The parts make the body and you have a part to play which means you, insert your name here, you matter. All for one and one for all, the great cry of the three musketeers. All for one means we are all here for you. We are all here for you. 
we want you to share this time with us. Now, the Bible has a large number of statements that say one another, love one another, encourage one another, uh, strengthen one another, build each other up, and more. Well, we, the people of the Heathmont Presbyterian Church, we want to do this. We want to do this with you, but here's something you need to know. And if anyone thinks I'm talking to you particularly, I'm not. But if you're pretty sure I am, well, maybe God is. It's hard to encourage someone who isn't here. It's hard to strengthen someone who stays away. It's hard to build up someone who won't join in. When a child is baptised, the congregation is asked this question. And we've had the joy of having asked this question a few times in recent years. Will you be faithful to your calling as members of the Church of Christ so that by God's grace, this child may grow up in the knowledge and love of Christ? And in, when we say, I will, we are saying that we are all here for that one child. And we are all going to be that model of what a Christian disciple is. All for one. And one for all. The church exists as a community. Whatever else you can be alone, I'm not sure you can be a church on your own. And this is where I want you to listen carefully. Many people in many churches will say, but what can I do? I have nothing to offer. And I, I know what it's like to be ready and willing to serve and to make yourself available and to never be asked. Um, if, you, if, I, if you have a sense that I'm doing that to you, just tap me on the shoulder again and say, remember, I'm still here. I tend to forget some things. Many people might say, what can I do? I have nothing to offer. I want to say, you do. And you do much more than you know. In my ministry life, or our ministry life, uh, we've been a part of churches large-ish and churches small, very small. And when you're in a small church, you'll have that one week, that one week when everybody's there. It's remarkable. Betty's smiling because she knows I'm talking about Wolverton. And everyone will say, wow, isn't it good? Isn't it good where everyone is here? And I want to say to those people, yes, it is. Are you coming back next week? It is good when everyone is here. It matters when everyone is here. So what can you do when you think you can't do anything? Turn up. You may not know, you may not appreciate at all what an impact it makes when you just turn up. I want to say sit in the front row too, but uh, that's another issue. Uh, greet people as they arrive. You can do that. Sing out loud. Don't worry about singing well. Sing out loud. The more you do, you might be surprised the better you get at your singing. Talk to people in the church. You can do that as they arrive over morning tea, as you sit down next to someone. Sit next to someone different each week. Ask questions about people. Look for ways that you might be able to get involved. Now, in the Presbyterian Church of Victoria, uh, we take safety really seriously. And so there's, there's areas within the church that if you want to be involved, you need to go through a, a safe church process, a volunteer application process. We have no apology for that. That's important. That's essential. So look for ways that you might get involved and ask that question. And make a choice. Make a choice to be here. This quote comes from Unmissable Church. 
The choice to be at church is a choice to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a choice to be part of soul-nourishing fellowship. It is a choice to serve others by my presence and with my gift. It is a choice to sit under the word of God and to glory in his name. And so for those of us who are joining us online, we're so pleased that you're able to do that much. We're so pleased that we're able to do this for you. But if you can be here with us, that will be much the better for you and for us. And if there's a closer church to you, get there. It is a choice to sing the praises that God deserves. It is a choice for the kingdom of God. The church is the body of Christ and the body works best when all parts are working together because it is all for the common good. What you do is for the common good. Different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all people for the common good. Friends, never lose sight of this. Never lose sight of this. It is all for the common good, which means ultimately it is all for Jesus. For he is the head of the church, not for my glory, but for his. The church is a body to which you belong. Don't be you know, Van Gogh and cut off your ear. Keep the body whole. The body is many parts and you are one of them. So play your part. And the parts make the body, which means you matter. You matter to us. You matter to Jesus. The church is the body of Christ and the body works best when all parts are working together. Remember that sheep story? That one sheep who'd gone away and Jesus went out to find that sheep, not just to check on it, make sure it's okay and leave it there, no, to pick it up and bring it back, back to the flock, back where it is safe, back where there is pasture and the shepherds. It's the same for Christians. We find our safety in Christ We find our safety together. Well, let's pray. And loving Lord God, I thank you for the gift of the church, for all its failings, for all its problems, for all its weakness. I thank you that you have given to the world the gift of the church. And I thank you that you don't mean for us to be out wandering the world on our own as uh, vagrant, nomadic disciples of Jesus but you call us together and you bring us together. And Lord, in a country like ours, where we have such freedom to do that, help us not dismiss that freedom, but to come together, to encourage each other, to help each other, to spur one another on to love and good deeds and to worship you in community. Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Right